Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 27th Regen Ag Chat with me, Liz Jennifer and Nick Renison. Um, this evening, we've got Jim. <laughs> I've whipped out of pronouncing his name already. Um, Hamey, um, we've got him talking about his approach to mob grazing. Just before we hand over to him, uh, Nick, what have you been up to? Um, I'm I'm already worrying about how I'm going to pronounce <laughs> Amy. Jim is going to have to be Jim. Um, so, Liz, um, what have, I've been up to loads and I've I've been up to loads so much that I have been like a rabbit in headlights and I've now stopped and I've had a bug all week. So I felt dreadful all week. But I have been, well, we both went to Nicole Masters. Yep. Um, at Althorpe. And then we went straight from there to Groundswell. Um, and that was amazing. Uh, my highlights uh, were meeting Bruce, our Irish chap who's coming over to do the Dung Beetles, and uh, Matt Swarbrick at Hembant. Um, and then um, Renner and I spoke at the Down to Earth conference, um, which was the Down to Earth North at um, Trapenna, the cheese people. And that was interesting. It was uh, quite dairy based. Um, I was asked a question, could a thousand cows in one herd ever be regenerative inside? And I said, no. Some people left the tent at that point, um, but um, I don't think they can. Um, we've had a school from Westminster in the middle of London here, um, brought some um, like 15 year old kids up to see um, what we were doing here. Um, they, it was it. What was interesting was they knew they were very intelligent kids. They knew the nitrogen cycle. They knew all the technical stuff. But when it came to actually digging soil and scratching around with worms, no interest at all. <laughs> um, but um, but they were they were they were they were interested in the in the kind of food thing. They um, they inhaled a ribeye steak. Um, but yeah, no, it's just been really busy. Um, and. We're just, um, I can't think what else I've got to do at the minute, but um, yeah, just tootling on. The cat, bulls are going in on the 20th and uh, everything's quite good, really. We've got loads of grass because we haven't got any sheep. <laughs> and, um, and you've got two speaker engagements already booked. Oh, yeah. Um, mm. But I think I, the reason I'm being asked to speak everywhere is, not, is no nothing, um, maybe it's carbon calling, but it's because I'm a girl in a in a or a woman in a male industry um and um I probably let rip a bit more than normal well-behaved people I think it could be that you actually know your stuff and it's and it is <sighs> they want to listen to you could be that oh, well we had we you and you, you were here for when our MP came up so yeah. last week yeah Neil Hudson came up and saw us with um James Robinson it's from Strictly um and um he saw a cow move he he came and said he only had 40 minutes and we marched him quite a long way away and we did this cow move which was really good actually and he did it was it was uh I think he got it he kind of got the rotational grazing and the rest periods and stuff but um yeah no I it uh, he, I think he got it but I don't know I don't know if we did any good but we'll see but what about you Liz um well I've applied to be part of Nicole Masters Create program over here. So I had an interview on yesterday, so we'll hear next week. So that's an intensive 40 week program here. So we'll see. Not sure how well I'm going to fit in, but it'll be fine. Um, it'll be fine. And yeah, just starting to do more sort of regenerative approaches, mainly with some family support, maybe sometimes without. My chickens are looking well, three weeks right. in. So not I've all alive. Are they all alive? Yeah. Huh? So yeah, three weeks old. Um, and then I went on a curing and smoking course, and I decided I'm going to open a um uh, built on business. So I might just save that for another year. But so that was interesting as well. So sort of this, we spend all this time making the meat. How can we make the best of it? So so I've got a salami slowly curing in my garage, which may or may not kill me. So we'll see. So. <laughs> But also, Liz, what well, well, the thing that you keep quite quiet about is the fact that you've got a pub next door to you who buys all your meat. Not all, a lot. They buy a, lot a lot of it, which is pretty cool, really, to have a pub next door and then they have it on the menu and it sells out. That's that's amazing. Um, yeah, and they gen and the if it's got a 
people love it in terms of I think it's the in as they drive in do you mean they've potentially seen the animals grazing in the fields nearby so and they're all it's all within the parish basically they've produced so um but what I find interesting it's not necessarily loads of sales from the pub but it they're not those people aren't necessarily then wanted by it direct so we need to do a bit of work on the foodie side I think so getting more people engaged in where the foods come from and why they want to use that in their recipes so that's a sort of an area we want to focus on next so just on um food so reno had uh, a week in quite a busy this is in my very busy time he had a week in romania with the pfla the pasture fed livestock um association and um he was there for 10 days was it a 10 no 10 people for seven days and he so he's got very excited now about uh agro Tourism. Yeah. So it's bringing people, um, they can be from overseas or they could be just from this country, onto farm, um, giving them a farm walk, uh, feeding them, eating with them, like chatting to them, getting maybe a little bit drunk with them, um, having accommodation if, if you've got it on the farm, um, and then kind of selling that as an experience. And then obviously they they buy your produce, but you've it's it's um this quite good model really so i know you're thinking about that but that's i think that's probably got legs um so uh he's come back very interested in that but um he did say yes at one point he wanted to milk cows and sell cheese but i, I don't want to do that we've all anyway. got <laughs> anyway <laughs> have we got some carbon calling news liz uh yes we have so irritatingly well no we um last year we did obviously Cumbria and this year we were planning to do two sites. Unfortunately, Farm Ed in the last week have decided they no longer want to, want to host the second venue, which is an awkward. Um, Jamie's already booked his flight, so he will be here. And our plan is to do, we won't do full comp or another full conference, but we'll do some technical workshops like a J Jamie on tour. Sorry, Hamy on tour. I apologize. Um, so yeah, will be uh, the dates will still be the sixth and seventh of September. Venues to be confirmed. If anybody wishes to host a farm walk plus workshop, so you've either got a village hall or community centre, something nearby, or an on-farm facility, then please let us know because that would be great. Or you know someone who could do that. Um, it's not. We've still got quite a few weeks, but um, that's our plan at the moment. So if anybody's got any ideas of venues, we've had chats with various people. So there's ideas coming. But um, yeah, just it's say those, irritating, those, but we can work through it. Just say those dates again. So because so in Cumbria, it's on the 9th and 10th. 10th. Yeah, so the main conference is the 9th of September and Hamy, uh, Ian Bell and Anna de la Vega are doing workshops on the 10th. Of September, but the main conference is on the 9th. The Cotswolds activity was the 6th, 7th. We'll do a technical workshop with Hamy somewhere in the South Midlands, probably on the 6th, uh, somewhere slightly further north on the 7th, and then we'll head to Cumbria ready for the 9th. So that's the working plan. It's evolved in the last week or so. But yeah, um, looking for. Oh, Phil, update from Phil. Apparently he was doing it. So, well, it's news to <laughs> him. I need to speak to you, Phil. Ignore me. Oh. I oh. think we're going to change it slightly, Phil, but this is not maybe the way of communicating to you. I thought you were on holiday. Right. Um, the second point, that's it for carbon calling. I've now gone very hot. <laughs> so we may, well, we may have, we'll have further updates, won't we? And we'll put them on Instagram, Twitter, on the website, but just keep, um, keep an eye out. But, um, Jim is in the country and um, Cumbria will go ahead and looks like um, we'll be having something in the south, um, hopefully with Phil. But um, yeah, so Jamie, last time we, Jim, I'm going to call you. <laughs> and last time we spoke to you was uh, to, uh, 2020? I yes, think. 2020, yeah. And we called you the, what was this, what was it called, Liz? The YouTube, um, the um magical man of minerals and mycorrhizae something yeah. like that yes international man there mycorrhizae and minerals yes yeah and you were at one of our biggest hits oh great yeah you know that that's good to know <laughs> so welcome back um so 
Um, for those who don't know you, can you just give us a bit of background on you? Um, yes. And kind of set the scene, but just first of all, just about you. Okay. Uh, I started at 12 years of age. Now I am 62. So that was 50 years ago to garden my own vegetable patch with rabbits to make my own compost as I was not allowed to use any chemicals, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, or any synthetic fertilizers. So I had to do it all with a hoe and a spade and learning. And I was a voracious reader. So I learned how to do it and I had success. Then I went forward to where I studied agronomy engineer majored in large livestock, beef cows and dairy cows. When I was able to buy my first farm, that was in 1990, I was by then, wow, I was old. I was uh, 30 years old. And, uh, and I started doing conventional uh, practices. And I quickly realized that I was degrading the soil and losing money. So I had to find a way to farm like I gardened before. That's why it's so important when you, you mentioned those kids that they knew the nitrogen cycle and all that, but they didn't get down to the, close to the soil to observe and smell it and touch it. That's where we have a, a bond with nature. We are an integral part of nature. And if we don't, if we're not close to nature, to the soil, our animals, our grass, we will not make the best decisions. Uh, academic knowledge is no good if you don't have that intuition that you get from staying close to the land. That's very important. That's why I said we need to farm as we gardened. Now, now I can do it with the help of livestock that um, make it exponential in ease. It's so easy to do it with livestock because they have four feet and we only have two. Now I don't have to break my back with the hoe and the spade, only in very special cases. So that's what I'm doing now. And that's why I'm, I am so enthusiastic about and passionate about showing others how to learn to do it in their own farms. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so and where, where do you, are you in Texas now? Mm -hmm. Can I just oh, ask a point, sorry, in that? So you, you mentioned you weren't allowed to use any chemicals. Was that because of what was the reasoning or that was just the- My age, I was 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't wise. allowed. Got you. Okay, fair enough. But Sorry, I had I to learn organic. Dramatic. I had to learn organic ways before they were popular. And now I call what I do uh, beyond organic ranching or farming because uh, organic is not good enough. We need to regenerate. And we need, for example, um, if you have cattle and you can feed them organic grain and still ruin their quality of that beef, omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and CLA in there in the beef. So I, we need to go beyond that. Uh, ruminants were designed to thrive on grass, not on grains. So that's what I teach. Now I have a experience as a dairy nutritionist for 27 years and experience on grazing for 33 years. And I have uh, experience in adaptive genetics and selection guidelines for over 14 years, having made all the mistakes you can think of in my 34 years of livestock career. And um, and in terms of you've also got you've got some clients here. I know when we spoke a while ago, you you were talking to people in Europe, but but you've recently been over here. You were in a, you came to do the conference in Wales in June time. Yeah, that was a great conference. I loved it. I enjoyed it because I was able to talk about my passion, creating a sponge in your soil. If we do not create a spongy soil, there is no gas interchange. And as we know, 78% of the air we breathe is nitrogen. So why buy costly synthetic nitrogen? Why not use what is in the air available to our plants if we change it through soil life to a plant usable form like a nitrate or a nitrate? So that's why the nitrogen cycle is so important. So I can talk, I can talk in um, in different levels of expertise, but I prefer to do it 
in a simple and easy to understand way and get out the complicated. Okay. So, and I think you, you'll probably come on to it, but Rich has already has asked about this. The talks about you talk about the difference between humus and other types of carbon, and mm -hmm. perhaps adding that carbon to the soil. Can he explain it, please? Yes, this is very interesting. Uh, around in 2020, 2020, there started to come out in the science press, scientific articles that show us how humus, the slow cycling carbon uh, mode, is created. Humus is our soil's real fertility, and it's a slow cycling carbon that will last over 100 years, and we need to increase it in our soils to be able to have what the, in English was called good heart. Good heart in the soil means that your seedlings will do well without any fertilizer application. When they do not do well, that means for surely that your uh, soil humus is low. Soil humus is the degraded and stable fraction of organic matter that cannot be further degraded by the action of microorganisms. It's what gives our soil its dark color, its musty smell like the soil under the leaf of a litter uh, of the forest litter, and what greatly enhances productivity. It's a storehouse for nutrients, holds moisture, and microorganisms. Without it, soil will be dirt. That's the truth. So how can we create more of it? It's not by litter as we were taught. And that's what came up out in 2020, 2021, 2022. I learned this like 10 years ago from a very bright man. But let me explain. Humus is created by the decomposed fat micro bodies of microorganisms fed by the root exudates of our plants. I'm going to repeat. Humus is created by the decomposition of the fat microorganisms in the soil fed by the root exudates of our plants. Now, we were taught in basic biology in high school or secondary school, depending on your country, how photosynthesis, work, photosynthesis works. Green leaves produce energy through photosynthesis, and stalks or stems consume energy by respiring, mostly. We know there is a night cycle and a daytime cycle, but this means that the green leaf to stem ratio is very important in determining how much energy is available for productivity and to create new humus. So when we have more green leaves producing energy than stems consuming energy, we will produce more plant growth and more humus. And that's why the type of grazing we do is so important. So this has to do with basic plant physiology, right? Selective grazing where we take the green leaves off, as most people and great gurus out there tell people to do, leaves the stems or stalks behind consuming energy that are in reserve in the, in, the, in the roots and grounds of the plants. So when we take them both off, we not only improve our desirable species ratio, but we also increase our productivity. If we allow, if we cut it or mow it with a, like for making hay, we cut it short, but not before the plants have fully recovered. We do the same, but with livestock. And that gives us a much higher product production because of the hoops and saliva effect. So the, okay. so in, yeah, so in terms of, no, the, so the, the key thing in that, isn't it, which is, is allowing a plant to get to full maturity, to have optimum. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I explained, when you make hay, do you allow the plant to reach full maturity? Yes. Yes, okay. Well, if it was a, a lucerne, you will not allow it to go to full maturity in, in grazing, I would, but if it was so uh, in right silage, right, so uh, yeah. silage production, we wouldn't let it go to full seed, but traditional haymaking here, we would generally get it to go to full seed. I agree, full, full. I fully agree with that. But okay, let's say for silage, uh, you want a quality 
And in the green season is when we want our livestock to grow and get fat. So we want our focus in the green season is quality. At the same time, because we are producing so much more, because we are avoiding overgrazing. Do you know what overgrazing is? Overgrazing is regrazing a plant before it has fully recovered. It's like if you made hay out of your juvenile plants and cut it again and again and again, that will weaken the roots. We do the opposite. We want strong and deep roots. So we allow it to go all the way to maturity in your environment. Okay? Not when it's brown. No, no. When it's high quality. That's number one. Then that will allow you to stockpile in area a lot of acreage or hectares. So that's what we are doing there in North Wales. We divide the farm in thirds. The first third we manage for quality when it's raining. The second third is as a buffer for when it doesn't rain, like it didn't last time I was there in, uh, in June. It didn't rain, so you were in a drought. So then they put the, their 750 dairy cows on that third. The third third of the last third, we stockpile it for winter. But because right now they are in the transition, we just stopped applying synthetic uh, nitrogen because we do it in gradually. We take it off gradually. In two years, we're off it. So that means their perennial ryegrass, which is a monoculture mostly there, uh, lays down and rots if you stockpile it. So we want to do a little silage out of it until we have more biodiversity so it doesn't rot when it lays down. And we're having great results with uh, coxfoot. And coxfoot is outproducing rye, perennial ryegrass without any fertilizer. So when you change your methods and your main uh, way of doing things, you change from a monoculture to a, bi a high biodiversity above and below ground. Now let's go back to humans because that's very interesting. I say that the microorganisms need to be fat so they can be converted into humans. If they don't contain oils, fats, they are, will not be converted into humans to slow cycling carbon. And they will be fast cycling carbon, which is organic matter. Like when we uh, plant a cover crop and the effects disappear very fast. We want long-term benefits. So we need fat microorganisms. Yeah, go ahead. So, no, just, so the, the reason why we want fat is because it then protects from degradation from other bacteria. Exactly. Okay. Now let me explain. Uh, these microorganisms, when they die, they are decomposed by other microorganisms for many generations. The last digestion is carried out by fungi. Fungi can digest fats and oils, but only up to a point. And then after a process of mat maturity called humification, it becomes humus or stable degraded fraction of organic matter. Yeah, that's, that was a good observation, Liz. I'm, a, I, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm such a geek. Um, but I just think, it, and I think what's intriguing is how much we've all learned. I know in the in, since we last spoke to you, I think this is what's, we are getting it slowly. We're now, it's about application. But just, um, I know we're on back to, sorry, let's carry on humus. I've got some questions about the North Wales farm, but we'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, next, I wanted to say that in a farm that we have been applying all of this together, the total grazing program, because it is a program of a, not only one event of grazing event, but a program through the year and multi years, because we want to keep increasing productivity every year with simple, low cost biological methods. Then the adaptive genetics and selection of which we are already starting there in North Wales and uh, nutrition. We need to know a little about nutrition because for example, uh, cool season grasses, which is what you have the most there, are low in fiber, high in sugars and high in protein. 
And that means that you can have at the same time in your environment when you selectively graze acidosis and a high pH in the, in the body. And I, I observed that there. You just look at, your, at the manure of your livestock, mostly in cows. You will see that when it starts to dry a day after it's deposited in the floor, it will create a white, dusty powder and in the crust. And that's acidosis, a telltale of acidosis. And that's because the sugars, the main energy form of cool season grasses, which is what you have, are very high in solubility or oxygen. They're so high that they create acidosis. So it's very interesting. You can get clear of that problem just by doing the total grazing program allowing your grasses to mature a little more. For example, if instead of uh, grazing the uh, perennial rye grass at the two and a half leaf, go to three and a half and see what happens. What happens is that your milk, urea, nitrogen, if you have a, a dairy, will go down, but your productivity should not go down and your animal health will go up. And that's where the money is. So, Jim, as far as um, when, when you're grazing, how, because we, we do, am I right in thinking you're for um, grazing everything off? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we, Just we like, do quite a bit of trampling and you, you don't, you're not uh, into trampling. Uh, there is some, some sort of trampling. Uh, for example, we want to achieve a 90% harvest efficiency, efficiency. When you make hay, what harvest efficiency do you want to get? 30% or 90%? Mm. Yep. Yeah, I see. 90. The same with our livestock. We want a high harvest efficiency. Now that we know how humus is really created, it all fits together with what happened 20, 30,000 years ago, which I'm going to explain in a while. Once you start grazing this way and you take the whole plant into your animals and recycle those nutrients via the urine and manure, that's when you start to get a much higher harvest efficiency. And that is what will allow you to go much lower in your rotation. And that's what gives you a longer recovery period in the green grazing area and a much larger acreage to stockpile for a summer drought or the winter in the rest of your property. Now, uh, how can we grow strong and deep roots? By grazing selectively, where you take all the green leaves that produce the energy and leave the stems that consume the energy and have to return faster, creating overgrazing, or by taking everything off, which keeps a longer rest period, which creates strong and deep roots, and allows a much better leaf, green leaf to stem ratio in the regrowth. When you grow, when you mow your grass, what comes up first, stems or leaf? Leaf. Of course, leaf. The same happens in your pastures. But when you inoculate the saliva of your livestock close to the growing points, the roots and the crowns, that's when the regrowth is much faster, up to 80% faster, because that's how grasses and livestock co-evolve together. And that's where I want to go 30,000 years before man appeared on scene, if I am allowed. But, the, and I'm, I'm not being, I am being slightly thick in terms of my questions, because, Jean, if we think back to the prairies or wherever we're heading towards. No. Well, no, but in terms of if we think back to how... 30,000 years ago before man appeared, not after man appeared. That's, it was already degraded after man appeared. But in terms of if we're thinking of wild, okay, grasslands, before humans arrived, animals were wandering across them in a migratory impact. Would they stand in one point and graze that plant down to the floor? No. The important thing that we need to consider is that half of those herbivores by body weight, by mass, were hind gut fermenters. And the other half were ruminants. When man came, 
they killed off the large hind gut fermenters because they were easier to hunt. And that role that they carried, which was to take all the combustible material off the land, was not filled by any other animal. And we know this by fossilized records of pollen and archaeological findings. There were no, almost no wildfires before that period. For a million years, there were very little wildfires. Wildfires started after those megafauna, pine gut fermenters like mammoth, uh, uh, woolly rhino, and mastodons disappeared. That's when we started having wildfires, and then man started to burn the leftovers of the ruminants that inhibited the regrowth of the growing points and new seedlings to lure in the migratory herds of by now on the ruminants. So it's so we're managing those ruminants to basically act as both of those animals to interact. Exactly. Them. And that's that's the title of a, a masterclass I'm creating right now. How to do to fill the niche or the role of those large hindgut fermenters with our three species of domestic ruminants that we now have. Yes. I love the phrase hind guts. And... <laughs> I quite like some woody ruminants. No, no. Well, we cannot have them uh, topple trees down like an elephant will do, but we sure can do, can make them consume everything and not leave any combustible material after they live on their migration. Now we cannot have them migrate, right? But we have, we can stockpile in area in our own property and that will take the place of the migration. And just coming back to the, your example of in North Wales, so the graze a third of the farm, sorry, allocate a third to quality. A, a third of the area. Yeah, yeah, a third of the area to, to buffer and a mm -hmm. third of the area to stockpile. So is that you've you've learned those ratios based on what you've your other experiences and just is that just no that's correct it depends on the environment because you have such a beautiful environment you so I all all of Wales is pastoral livestock and you have mostly um, they call it a drought with three weeks of no rain we call it a drought after nine months of no rain in my area so it's all you, relative we we you, do we it, are used all, to rain. It's all relative, but I can tell you, and I told everybody there uh, last November that I was there, that you can easily surpass, surpass uh, New Zealand in productivity per acre because you can do it correctly and they are not doing it correctly. Even though they have a, a slightly easy, easier environment, you have uh, better people, I think. Yeah. I can talk. Yeah, no, no, really. I, I love I love. Yeah, I agree. I love that. I love that because people, when I explain, they understand very fast and they ask very intelligent questions. And I haven't been to New Zealand, so I cannot compare. But in other countries, boy, it's difficult to drive the point across. So, so Jim, I, I, I'm like the thick one out of me and Liz. So you've got to talk a bit simpler with me. Yes. So we are doing... Yes, you're not meant to agree. Uh, we are doing, uh, we so we do rotational grazing, day shifts on quite tall covers, um, quite a big mob. And um, it, it varies, but we normally leave, they've trampled on quite a bit. So yeah. in your, um, what, what would we do to graze gym, the gym way? Let me start by saying, that my students, and I have students across the world in every country that livestock are raised, well, not, not every country, every environment. In most of the countries, I, we have over, um, I think 27 countries, over 750 students having success. Problem with rotational grazing is that it is selective grazing. When you don't take everything off, livestock will always select the best species and take them off down to the ground and leave other species rejected and or the best parts of the plants. And then when they come back, because you didn't take 90% or 80%, you took maybe half, let's say, I don't know your situation, 
but let's say you took half and that, okay. You take half, then you need to come back almost twice as fast. And that means that the plants that were grazed down to the ground the first round will be tender, young, and lush, while the plants and parts that were rejected in the first round will be older and ranker. So which one do you think they will select in the second round? Uh, no, I, I do, I get you. But, but, but when we've done quite quick, probably um, more your style of grazing, we get very runny poo. Uh, you cannot and do it quick. You cannot do it quick. You need to do it very slow. If you're doing it quick, you're doing the opposite of what I just said. No, no but when, when we when we when we uh, grazed quite hard, are you, are you saying you put them into quite tall covers and you leave them there till they've finished it all? Mm -mm, no, 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 no. You said you were moving them once a day. Yeah. So you need to give them a, as large an area as they think as they can consume in eight hours. If you give them long, larger area and you have them stay there longer, that's precisely what you shouldn't do. Because I told you that the uh, cool season grasses are very low in fiber, high in sugars, and high in protein. So they're going to select the first day, the tops, and that will create scours. But it, because but of a lack of fiber. Yeah, go ahead. But, it, but in Nick's example, so they would be going into taller covers. So you, you wouldn't, they're not lush, are they? But I suppose it's an allocation no, question. So no, you no they, they, will the be, they, they will be lush. Because once we take the stems and leaves off in the first round, the second round, it will be lush much higher leaf, green leaves to same ratio. But we need in your cool season grasses for the plant leaves to fall down and touch the ground before we start grazing them. That's before they go to, to flower. That's, but mine, um, why is it? Uh, let me explain it in another way. If it's a plant is like this, well, it's taller, but it doesn't fit here. It's like this, and you cut it in thirds, the top third will have the less fiber, the higher energy, and the higher protein. The second third will be lower in energy and protein and higher in fiber. And the bottom third will be the highest in fiber, but lower in energy and protein. So first, let's look at fiber. Our ruminants require fiber to be able to ruminate. To ruminate. So if we feed them only the tops, they will surely scour from lack of fiber. Yeah. So it's it's trying to get them to eat the whole of the plant, isn't it? That's the and that's the debate. Is that um... actually actually it's very easy in your environment. We're doing it with dairy cows. Uh, it's not a problem. The problem is when you allow them to select, and they will select only the tops, and you will get scours. Uh, how do you feel when you have the skirts or diarrhea? Do you feel energetic and healthy? Well, the same happens to your livestock. Don't do that to them. Keep them healthy. I love my livestock and I want them healthy. Optimal health is number one priority for me. So, so the other thing that um, we're told that is that, so if you, if you leave some um, cover on the fields, you then have solar panels to... Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Do you mean if your livestock live behind green leaves? Mm. Tell me how so, does that work? How is that working for you? Well, it, well, it, at the minute I'm thinking it's working okay, but it's uh, you're making me doubt everything. <laughs> no, no. Observe. Uh, are they living behind green leaves that are carrying out photosynthesis? Oh, so so you're saying so if they're leaving stem behind, it's not. That's what livestock tend to do worldwide. If I go to Iceland or if I go to the desert in, in the Sahara or if I go to the islands of Maui in Hawaii, that's what livestock do. And I have observed in all of those environments, even in Alaska and Canada and everywhere. Livestock do not graze like a, a mower. You cannot set the height that they graze to. They, then the, those grazing gurus says, yeah, but on average, they are grazing half the plants. 
Well, tell that that to your best quality grasses and herbs and legumes that were taken down to the ground and killed by overgrazing because of doing selective grazing. Just doesn't make sense, doesn't fit basic physiology, doesn't fix, doesn't fit biology, doesn't fit how humus is created, and does not fit how nature designed grazing before man killed those hind gut fermenters. And, it's the, and I, for me, it's the, it's the how we can manage it through the season. That's my query, oh. I suppose, is that yeah. I can I can get it for it might work. It obviously works for longer because you're doing it. But I can I can see it for how it works for periods of the year. It's just trying to work out how it works for all the year through. Yes. How it works in practice, that's, that's so much easier than explaining all the mumbo jumbo behind it. In practice, it's, you only need to divide your acreage, not your in, in terps, more or less terps. Then you start raising what your livestock can maintain the quality of. Let's say you start, you have a hundred acres and you start uh, trying to graze off 33 acres. By the time your first paddock is ready to be regrazed, that means the leaf starts to fall down and touch the soil. There will be like 12, 14 inches tall, maybe 20, depends on your soil humus content. Then you go back and regraze that and don't keep advancing in your rotation and allow the rest to stockpile. And that's where you're going to divide the rest in half. Now you have thirds, three thirds. Okay, then let's say you're happily grazing 20 acres of the 100 because that's all your number of livestock can maintain the quality of, okay? You're grazing that and then we get a summer dry like we just did in May, June. Well, then you go to the buffer area that you have in reserve and you graze that. The third or the last third, you either make it into silage around June 21st, or if it's not perennial ryegrass, you allow it to stockpile longer. You need to do trials and make sure that it does not rot. If our stockpile rots, we lost it. So no use in that. Okay. Then hopefully we get the fall rains. Then uh, uh, speed of grass growth goes up and then we keep grazing those two thirds the green season third and the buffer third and allow the third the last third to accumulate for early winter grazing you keep grazing those up into when it grows uh grass growth stops you keep grazing that until you finish it off all of it okay I know what you're thinking. Uh, we need to leave a, a soil armor. Well, it, it, that hasn't proven to be true. We have been doing this up in Saskatchewan, Canada, where it gets to minus 30 Celsius. So no, that didn't happen. Because we are having the roots and grounds full of energy reserves, okay? So we take it down, all of it, and then go to the stockpile area to finish it off before it rots in the case of its uh, only perennial ryegrass, monoculture. Once we get better biodiversity, we're going to be able to graze further into the winter. Alternatively, you can also defer some of that for early spring. So you can have your livestock when they are calving or lambing, graze uh, brown and green grass, mixed together so they do not get the scours that Nick described. That's very important. You see, when they are calving and lambing, we don't want to be moving them much. We want them to bond with their babies. That's very important. I explained that also. So so in terms of that, so that and so it's small allocations net. So you're basically working across that area and then Come the winter, you've basically moved on to that third third, basically, of the area. And yeah. so two thirds are then resting as the ambition to rest them over, I suppose, two, three months, probably. Well, I, I haven't I haven't reached that yet. Uh, how small the area? 
well, the amount of grass that they can finish off in eight to nine hours, but we want them full, full, uh, the gut feel at the end of the day and hungry in the morning, not starving, hungry. Uh, my mantra, and I always repeat this, fat cows, fat cows, fat cows. Do not ever allow your cows or sheep or goats to lose body condition. It's all important. Uh, a cow and happy cow, a, a, a fat and happy cow can give you profits. A starving or a low body condition cow will not. My grandfather, he had three, 5,000 cows. He will say, uh, give me fatness and I will give you beauty. That's very important. A fat cow is a beautiful cow. A starving cow is not beautiful. So, so Jim, are you saying in a 24 hour period, they eat solidly for eight hours? Uh uh no they no. don't no 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 no, so, no. So they, they've been they've had, yeah go ahead well, I don't I don't understand why you say they need to oh have okay eight hours. in reality cattle uh graze in in shorter averages of mm -hmm. like an hour and a half or two two hours then they lay down to chew their cot and then they graze another hour and a half I have observed them. Uh, for years doing it myself. And the best compromise is to move them four times a day. That's much easier than it sounds. You get a much higher harvest efficiency and conversion efficiency of your grass to saleable products because they do not foul with their dung and urine the grass before they consume it. When you give them a fresh break and they go in and graze, they consume everything and then they lay down in an hour and a half. They finish it. You, you uh, gauge the size to give them by observation. And then when they finish everything in an hour and a half, they lay down and half an hour later, you, in two hours, you give them a new break. They, and, and when you go to them, you wait for them to get up. And what does a cow do first when getting up? They deposit manure and urine. Then you give them the fresh plate. So they go in and they consume everything green and fresh. And then the microorganisms in the rumen are receiving a constant diet through the day. And Andre Boisson made this observation in 1965. Uh, cows belong to a labor union. They only graze eight hours a day. And that's true. They only graze for eight hours a day. And our work days are eight hours. So it fits nicely. So I usually start at, let's say we start at 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. Then at 11, another break. At 1, another break. Then at 3 or 4, the last break. And that's it. I go home. That's it. Very easy. It works, it works wonders. And that's how you triple stocking rate. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and I suppose that, so when we chatted to Fergus and David, I mean, they're, they're regularly moving. So they're based down in Kent and they would be moving animals quite a few times in the day, but some of that's you, with- You mean with David? No. A different one. Where? Um, so they're based down in Kent. So uh, like below London. Um, oh, okay. And- but they, in some regards, using the sort of spring, like the timing latches yeah. to mm -hmm. move the or to move the fences on as well. So there's well, I, I, I have observed, and I have tried up to 16 times a day breaks because I had a, a partner that told me that that was best. And he claims that it would work better, but he didn't have a farm. He didn't have cow. He was a molecular biologist. So he was great in minerals, but he didn't know grazing because I was doing it myself. I found out that when you give them more than four or five breaks on average, they start to get nervous. And I don't want that. I want them calm and ruminating. That's what makes profits and makes them happy. And I, and I suppose it's the, the justification for that is the tr tripling of stock, stocking rate, isn't it? So you, you are... It, that's what's driving the dream. People would argue that's a lot of time to spend moving cattle. But 
the downstream benefit is the increased stocking rent. But let me tell you, I say to my students and to myself, because I'm a perfectionist and that's not a happy way to live. I say to myself, excellence is 80% of perfection. So if you cannot get 90% and you only get 80% with once a day move, that's excellent. You will get most of the benefits with only once a day move. And I have proven that I have a client in Florida on warm season, low quality perennial grasses, tropical grasses that we're moving only once a day. And he has most of all the benefits, double the stocking rate, uh, much higher productivity, higher uh, real life fertility in the cows, half the cost, no, one third the cost. So he's happy. So that so the there is a question that's come in. Can this work on if you only move them once a day? The answer is yes. You just don't get the there's a more yeah. diminishing returns with that. Yeah, I was there at his farm last month, and I told him once a day moves is good enough, and that's true. And I stand by it. Now, if you want to be the best in the world, go to four breaks a day. So, and then I suppose it's a, there's a query back to so for Nick in her. Well, Nick and Renault's move, I mean, they're moving once a day into, an, into their allocation. So once a day moves fine, but that allocation would be reduced. Exactly. Allocation. exactly. And that will make the rest periods longer. What happens when you rest a plant longer? Well, when it has short roots because of selective rotation or grazing, it will go to seed. That's normal. That's what plants do when they sense stress. But once you go through one year of allowing longer rest periods, then your roots will go deeper and stronger. And that's what we need. You cannot create carbon in the soil if you're not, you do not have a strong roots. We transform our soil with the strong and deep roots of our species, of our desirable species of forage by managing our livestock. That's the secret. We have been able to uh, capture 55 tons per hectare of carbon per, per year doing this in Florida, which is difficult because it's much warmer. And, and that is on relatively poor soils to start off with, or does that matter? Oh, yeah, no, no, that's true. We started with one per, below 1% 1 organic matter, sandy soil, uh, it was degraded by continuous applications of glyphosate for 23 years as it was a tree nursery on potted plants. That's true. But let me tell you, when people or when those companies selling carbon offsets measure carbon, they are making a big mistake. They are measuring 12, 14 inches deep. Where does soil grow, upwards or downwards? Upwards. Upwards. So when they only mention 12 inches, they are making a huge mistake. And that's why people say, well, when you get to four, five, eight percent organic matter, you cannot continue to improve. They're wrong. You continue to improve because your soil is growing in inches per year upwards. And then, and I suppose that what they're trying to do is a balance, aren't they, across the soil profile. But it's, I suppose, and if you sampled it higher, you just have to interpret it differently, wouldn't you? Uh, so my that. conclusion is that we need to devise a, a different method. We cannot go by that. We need to find a different way. So, um, so um, Jim, on the on the farms you've been working on in this country, yeah. um, what their rotation length? What what typically are you working oh. on? That's great. Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, around 15 days, 10 to 15 days longer than you're actually doing. For example, how long does it take to go from a two and a half leaf stage to a three and a half leaf stage on perennial ryegrass? Depends on the time of year. Exactly. So when, that's why I answered that way. I cannot give a date uh, or so many days because it depends on the time of year. But let's say we go to the third, three and a half leaves. Yeah. It's a little more, not much more. We just want to stop scouring and to start uh, improving the soil with the stronger roots that we're going to create. 
Remember, we're not going to use any nitrogen. So that changes the whole system. So, so you're going to do this on a dairy farm in Wales? Uh, they're already doing it since uh, uh, two years ago. We've been doing it for two years now. O organic uh, lower, gradually taking the synthetic nitrogen out. This was the last year in 1st of May, around that time, it was taken off. And that and you mentioned that's just with grazing. So when we last had a chat, we were talking about sort of biological amendments. Oh, yeah. So are they using other things as well? They have not, but I hope they do. Let me explain. Uh, have you heard about the uh, Johnson compost, Johnson Sioux compost? Okay. I am doing trials right now in my own farm. And that's the beauty of your consultant having his own economically successful farm for all his life. It's very dif different to teach from theory and not actually doing it with the constraints of cash flow and those type of things. So I started by buying the leachate of that type of compost and put it, it on the land. And that increased productivity around 50 to 100%. So now I'm going to make my own uh, Johnson Sioux compost pile. And we are building it right now. It's already started. So I can apply that to my whole farm around every month. And that way I can increase my stocking rate. I'm a, a businessman first and foremost. So that makes sense in the economic sense, biological sense, and uh, society sense, everything, because I'm not using any synthetic bought-in inputs. So uh, uh, wait, and, and I propose that to, to these, uh, these people, and they are looking into it at the moment. Okay, so then so will be some amendments being made on potential yeah. Johnson Sue or I think yeah, that but... the infamous fish heads were I, I was ah, a bucket of fish ah, heads. But I remember that. that one. But let me fish tell you, if, if wait, if even low cost biological methods, you need to do a margin analysis on them. So do different trials. I did a trial with uh mineral salt from the sea, applied it. And then I did another trial with the uh, lichet from the compost pile with vermicompost with Johnson's Sioux type. And then I did another one with the liquid fish. And the one that gave me the best bang for the money in, invested was the, the compost, uh, vermicompost lichet. So that's what I'm going to do. So it's based on, Jean, and I suppose similar to their context, they would do Johnson Sioux trials alongside vermicompost or uh, fish, shall we say, or uh, something. I don't see the need now that I already did those trials. You see... No, the, you're the, not the, in the, North Wales. The, the fish will work, yes, and it will give you a good return. The mineral salt will work and give you a good return. The Johnson Sioux will give you a better return. But what if you apply them all together? I'm going to do the trial too. Okay. And I want to see if they add each other on as your uh, adaptive genetics and total grazing program add on and create a much better result. Do you know how a guild works on, on microbiology? A guild, a guild, a guild means a, a combination of different species at enough population that they create a much bigger result. Okay. Like when the Native American Indians planted uh, corn, squash, and beans. Okay. Yeah. Well, the same happens in our soils. But they, we need a high fungi to bacteria ratio and a high enough population of each so we get the guilt effect. So that's what I'm driving for. I want three, four times more productivity. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come in. So one is, in terms of the Johnson Sioux, Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how are you applying it, the compost? And um, are you using bio-priming of seeds? Are you using what? Bio-priming. So are you putting the seeds in compost before you sow them, if you're well, sowing seeds? Well, I don't plant anything. My, my grasses are perennial pastures. It's a field of pasture where I have trees, rows of trees, legume, fodder trees, every 25 meters 
in rows through the whole farm. In between, I have a mixture high in biodiversity with four types of grasses and six types of legumes, natives. The legumes, I didn't plant the grasses, they came in by themselves. So they are perennial, warm season grasses because that's in the tropics. That's my farm. But in Oregon, in a high altitude alpine environment that I was there last week, it's a different thing. So if you ask me about how do I do it, well, I do it through my irrigation system, or we can spray it with a boom sprayer where you pull the tank, 500 gallon tanks behind the tractor. That's one way of doing it. So you do so, it into the soil. Yeah. So in terms of almost as a tea on extract, you're doing the compost through a sprayer. I am not using the tea because the tea needs to be uh, fermented or aerated all the time. I prefer an extract. Yes, you just apply the extract. Okay. Um, and then there's a question about what kind of leguminous trees would you suggest for the UK straps? Oh, uh, yeah. Wales. No, I love it. Uh, you know, the Siberian peach rock or, or caragana? People ask me, well, will it stand or cold? How cold does it get? Oh, all the way down to minus five. That's hot <laughs> for Siberia. Yeah, Siberia peach shrub or caragana. Another one that will do great there is willow in the lower areas, poplar, uh, birch, uh, and the best one, uh, mulberry. Use the Pakistani variety that has the bigger leaves. And that will be great. And it's your insurance against, against a summer drought. Uh, Tom has added el elder, elder, sorry. Elder. elder, that's another one, yeah. Everything that your cattle like. Just, I saw all these beautiful edges, hedges you have all around, but they are too far apart. We need at least 25 meters in between the rows. I mean... I would like them 20 meters in between because when the roots of those trees touch themselves together, that's when the mycorrhizae and the guilt effect starts to take hold and your grasses will produce much more than without the trees. I took videos of that and they're on my website. Uh, if uh, They are there. Yeah. I have a, a PDF for free for people. I'm going to keep when, I, when I'm there. Uh, so they can uh, get it. And I have uh, on spongy soil, another one on adapt um, five secrets for cabin season to go without any problem and things like that that are um, tips for quick wins for you. Okay. That's um, interesting. Well, we all love, well, Nick's planting some wide hedges. I've planted some browsable hedges slightly closer to the, so yeah. We'll have a tree you, you need a fodder trees, fodder for your cattle. Yeah, you so a willow, a lot of willow, elder. Willow yeah. is great. I don't know, uh, black walnut, does it grow there? Black yeah. walnut? They does with great. me, land of milk and honey, not with Nick. Not, oh, no. Okay, and then no, in the States what, it works what, well. Yeah. What's the percentage that you might expect them to eat on a day to day basis from the tree? Yeah, let me start with the savanna. A savanna is 30% of the area in trees. When you have them like I am, like I do it myself and like I plan for all of my students, you have them protected by a, a string of wire, electrified wire, galvanized high tensile. And I put plastic PVC posts, three quarters of an inch, schedule 40, every 10 to 15 meters to hold the wire up, okay? This is for cattle. When I want them to graze it or browse it, I just move it closer together. Then they can direct browse if they are not too tall. If they are too tall, then I will need to copy them. And that's it. That's how you manage it. You only give it to your livestock when you need to, not all the time. So when you were in Wales, you'll have seen the hedges, but did mm -hmm. you did you think that we should have had more trees in the field, within the yes. field? Uh, yeah, when I said that 30% of the field should be in trees to, uh, to get the highest productivity of grass per acre, that's exactly what I meant, 30%. See, what, not what, what, not what, 5 or 2% that you have right now. 
what some farmers will say, particularly with willow, is that it will, what do they say? It will block up the drains and dry, do they say it will dry the field out? Do they say that? Oh, yeah. Willow, I will only plant in the low lane places where I saw that it was full of sedges and rushes. That's where you need the willows, not up in the dry. But then I saw, I, I saw continuously graze paddocks with chip that had sedges in the high parts. What does that say to you? That means there is a hard pan under it caused by years and years of continuous grazing, which you see compacted layers form when there are not enough strong roots and strong roots die when you weaken them by overgrazing, be it continuous or selective, it's still overgrazing. Now, selective rotational grazing is much better than continuous grazing, yes, but it still falls very short of the potential under the total grazing program. Um, just an, another couple of questions. So yeah, go uh, ahead. how does how well does Jim's system work with lay farming as the fat roots will need to regrow? To clarify, this is, it might be in grassland for five years, then it might go through a crop for two to three years. Um, so could the, the benefit could be increased in the lay in the grass bit, and then how do you manage it in the, the cultivation bit? That's correct, and this has been done for a long time, and the book I got it from was written by uh, Fertility Pastor by Newman Turner in the UK. And he explained how a rotation of uh, four to five years of a lay followed by two to three years of agriculture work the best. So this is time proven. And it's, uh, you only have to disc uh, three to four inches deep to turn your lay down and, and do agriculture, but without herbicides. You don't, it works better than with no tillage. I, I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And this has been proven. I have a friend that did it for over 30 years and the difference is there. You get better results this way, and you do not depend on costly inputs, and you do not contaminate the water around the island. That's very important in this, at these times. Uh, I am working with uh, the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maori. They want to prove that this can be done there, so they are not held responsible for all the contamination that the fer synthetic fertilizers are creating in the waters. So, that, and I suppose that, so this is the de the debate that is a constant, which is the plow, non-plow versus glyphosate oh. debate. I, I say this thing, I didn't say plowing. Please okay, so never, shallow, never, shallow cultivation. Shallow, never invert the soil because then you put the aerobic layer on anaerobic conditions and kill them. And you put the anaerobic layer on aerobic conditions and kill them. So that's uh, very bad for your soil. Never invert your soil. If you need to use a, a tillage, deep tillage, use a key line plow to not invert the soil, but only break the harpen. And then maintain it open with strong roots. You see, when, when we do agriculture, because we take all living plants, the mycorrhiza dies. The mycorrhiza only survives on a green plant, roots. When we till the soil, we kill the mycorrhiza. And that's why we need to uh, regenerate the soil with livestock and perennial pastures for four to five years. So we can take that off with a cash crop for two to three years. Now I have students that have found that they make more money with the lay and with livestock than with the cash crop. So it depends. Um Sorry, the questions are jumping around a bit, but there's um, Heather's back on the leguminous trees. Do they have to yeah. be inoculated if they're not native to here? Yes. Yes. Okay. What I suggest and what I did myself, I, I found trees in close to my farm that were growing nice and strong. And I took soil from under those trees to get the mycorrhiza and the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria resorbium to inoculate the seeds that I was going to plant because I plant my trees in a no-till way with, with a drill by seed. I do not uh, transplant little trees. That's very expensive, 300 times more expensive than if you no-till plant by seeds. 
And that's why I, I explain in my master class about silver pasture. Okay. Um, and then there's another another question about the coppicing tree, the fodder trees you talked about. Yeah. So things like black walnut, mulberry that sort of can grow in bits of the UK, do they regrow yeah. well when they've been coppiced or chopped is a question. Oh, they regrow beautiful because all the root reserves are there, but there are no stems to take all that energy off by respiring. So the regrowth is amazing. Yeah, I, I do it myself in my farm. It works great. Don't worry about it. And uh, here is a, a quick win for you. Uh, you can feed your livestock a small amount of biochar, 80 to 100 grams per cow per day, uh, seven, one seventh of that to a, a, a ewe, and you will get much better animal health because that will trap the acids created by the digestion of your high sugar forages, the lactic acid. And then your livestock, you will, if you do it, do it and, and then call me if this, if this is not true. In five to seven days, they will become so calm that you will notice a big difference. That means that they are healthy. They are a prey upon on animal. So when they don't feel good in health-wise, they are nervous. When they feel very good, they are calm. Um, and then another question. So by grazing, when grasses are at seed stage, so maturity stage, do you find that you get better spreading of different grasses across the grazing area, increasing diversity by seeds being moved by manure? My thought that the slower and later growing grasses, that would be Timothy here, so bluegrass, would be grazed out because they're unlikely to get the seed maturity if you're rotating over oh, a third of the area. Okay, I got confused, but when you, the area that is stockpiled to use in the early winter, yeah. yes, the seed, it will be able to reseed and then next year, that seed in the ground will be able to germinate. So it will be wise to allow those seedlings to grow strong enough before you put grazing livestock there so they don't pull them by, with the roots and kill them. Okay. How can you recruit seedlings of your best species if you return and regraze and you kill them? So but basically seed transfer is happening, isn't it? So you've just, you've got to, some of that stockpiled or even in the buffer, depending on the time of year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get, well, you would get well, seed transmission. And, and we rotate those, we alternate those uh, stockpile areas every year. So in three years, you have given a full stockpile uh, growth season to all of your farm. And that's where you start getting much higher results. Um, so this was related to your sedge question, or we would also rushes. So do you think in terms of though, if we're seeing those areas with rushes on top of the hill, um, would ripping areas, um, cultivation, subsoiling to try and deal with compaction, get rid of or reduce the amount of rush? Once in your lifetime. If you want to do it, do it once in your lifetime. And then do not allow the roots to grow weak by overgrazing ever again. And that will not reform. If you rip it and then keep grazing the same way, nothing will happen. It will go back to compact. That's the truth. And then there's an, just a question about the key line plow. Yeah. We we'll say the key line pie, but that may be me. Um, uh, he's on, uh, Nick's on sandy soils and he, he does have deeper rooting species, but he sometimes needs to cultivate deeper for, to deal with compaction on this particular soil type. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I work at this farm in Florida where we had very sandy soils and we changed that sandy soil with a hard layer four inches deep by using the key light plow once only. And then we allow the roots to grow deep and strong. And that prevented that compacted layer to reform. So you only need to do it once. Now, if you have more time than money, you can break that compacted layer by planting sweet clover, Cuban variety that a lot of people that I talked to in the UK didn't know what that was, is, that, what that is. It was the prime legume that Newman Turner planted in 1955. We, we need to go back to the future and bring back those old books, uh, Fertility Pastures is the name, 
and do what they did that worked after the World War, where, when everything was expensive and difficult to get. And before they were smart the people. Nitrogen. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Well, and before the nitrogen, he also wrote about the nitrogen, how we should not use it. Yeah. Um, what um, are your thoughts, Je um, Jim, on glyphosate? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, the soil that we had to re regenerate in Florida, the sandy soil, had been uh, killed off with glyphosate. So, yeah, I prefer not to use glyphosate. And that's why I say it's better to disc than to use glyphosate. Glyphosate does kill soil life. I had to uh, inoculate mycorrhiza on that sandy soil because all the mycorrhiza had been killed off. I know that was an excess of glyphosate, but even a, um, what everybody uses, I prefer not to use it by a long shot. It, it damages our guts, damages the guts of our cattle, our livestock, damages the guts of our soil, our soil life, damages everything. And it's one of those forever chemicals. It does not wear off or become inactivated. And if it does become inactivated, it can be activated again. So I had to deal with that. And the only way to take it off is to greatly increase your humus content because then it will hold it in such a way that it doesn't make harm anymore. But it's a very harmful uh, chemical. Even eight years after it, it was last applied, we still got problems with it. Okay, sorry, Liz, you got one more question, I think. I know it was um, Evie had asked a while ago, but in terms of how do you, it's about grazing system, sorry, we've moved on, but how do you work out a rough stocking rate to begin with? Or what yes. should we do? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I want people to be surprised by the answer. It's typically double the stocking rate that you have under rotational selective grazing. That's a record in many different environments. But let's say you're worried and you're afraid or you are scared of going up in stocking rate right now when we are so close to winter. Okay, then start applying all of this, the total grazing program. And then at the middle of winter, you decide based on how many cow days you have left in your stockpile, if you want to increase your stocking rate or not. While well, my students have achieved as an average of double the stocking rate, but they haven't been able to get double the amount of cattle they have. So they have started by taking off hay or silage feeding and by keeping all of their heifers. And then they increase around 50% uh, the, the next year in stocking rate. And then the next year they can go to double. That's, that's what they end up doing. At another client that he started with 1,200 cows, he went out and bought 2,000 more cows. So he got to 3,000 cows very fast. Yeah, he went out and bought them, just like that. Um, and the, just again, a point of clarification, is the third of the farm that's stockpiled, is it rested for the full year or just part of the year? Uh, no, in your environment, you cannot rest it for the whole year until you have very high humus content because most people do not have it. I would suggest to stockpile it after the, the grazing in July, August, and then stockpile it and use it in early winter. Once your soil improves, then yes, we can do it for the whole year. So it's sort of it's the setup that we would say for deferred grazing type. So that's, so you graze it through some of the season and then graze yeah. it. The, the, the last third, you can make a cutting of silage or hay in June, July, or hay in August. And then you stockpile it. Yeah. That, that's what I think that will fit the best in under your type of management and your level of soil humus that you have right now. After two or three years, we can do, start to do other trials and stockpile for a longer period. But the, I suppose that because it rains and we've got mm -hmm. reasonable soils, so the speed mm -hmm. of transformation could be quite quick on soils, couldn't yeah, they? That's correct. But let me tell you, I went to a, 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 a ewe farm, a chip farm. They had 2,000 ewes, okay? 
So I, I we started by dividing uh, in thirds. So we picked the, the places that we were going to stockpile since uh, June that I was there. So it was the hillsides that had very sparse growth of a better species, but very small because of uh, overgrazing. So those places I selected to stockpile from June up till October, November, and then start to stock to graze that with dry use. And that will fit in very nicely. He's going to save a lot of money. Um, a couple of three more questions, I think, and then we're nearly done. But one is, um, can it be done with just sheep? So I suppose your example is that we're trying it with just sheep. Two thousand. Oh yes, yes. Uh, I told this guy uh, you can do it better with sheep. The total grazing program that we cut. Yes, sheep are excellent for this, and I own myself a thousand ewes, so I know. Yes. Okay. Um, if the question about a clarification about the error again. So we in moving the cutting area each year. So, or potentially, you mean you're either buffering or you might cut it. Um, yeah. Some farms are limited on the area that you can cut. So for slope or stones or whatever. Um, how do you work that? So do you mean it's trying, you can't necessarily rotate around all of it, but I suppose that's stockpiled for longer or grazed. No, or... That's a good question. I'm going to answer the same that I told this man that had the thousand use. I much prefer you never make hay. If you need to buy hay, buy it from other people and graze as much of your grass as you can because the shortest, the distances between your grass and the mouth of your use, the more money you will make. Don't make hay. Don't make hay. Increase your stocking rate. Buy your hay. It is a, that I think is the, it's that along, well, making hay and selling stock when you're running out of feed is the two things we don't do very well. Uh, let's keep that out of the equation. When you, you need to have some hay, let's say a month worth of emergency supply. That's it. You don't need more. Once with cheap, with cheap, you can graze longer into the winter than with cattle because they don't park as much. So yeah, you can do it much better with cheap. And with cows, uh, we devise a way in that uh, big dairy, graze dairy to do it with cows, but you need uh, some infrastructure that not everyone has. Um, and a point from, or a question from Nick, which is, can you, I know it's, it can, how can you relate humus to organic matter? So if we've got high, if we've got high organic matter levels in soils, we've measured that. How do we know whether that's humus or not? Is there a test or what do we look for? I'm sorry, but I go by smell. Uh, I, I said that man is a part of nature and is not detached of nature. We are integral to nature. So we need to smell the soil. If you have a pit soil that has very high in organic matter, but it doesn't have hard humus, the seedlings will not do well. So there is no sense in having very high organic matter. We need available nutrients in the form of humus. That's, that's what we need to create, yeah? And the smell would be earthy with a uh, bit of wood. Yeah, musty, earth, earthy, like the litter forest, uh, the litter of the forest floor that you pick up and you smell it. It just smelled like that. And and everywhere I went in the UK this last trip, I didn't find it. That smell. Never. Not at all. Well, I've got oh. some. I've got and some. I found it in the bottom of one farm that this man had not used any fertilizers in 20 years. I found it there, but only there, a little. And anyone can them. do this, huh? It's not only me. Anyone can do it. The smell. Nick, where's yours? Well, I was just digging because so we've had a very dry time, Jim, as you know, in June. And then we've just had a lot of rain lately. And I was digging holes in the dry time and there was worms just tied up in knots and not many worms. And then tonight I went and dug some holes and and I do kind of smell the soil and kind of rolling it a bit. And it, and it, it was good. It smelled good. Um, but I was on some kind of permanent pasture quite high up. But um, I just I just had a message come in um, via WhatsApp. But someone wants to know who's your hero. 
Yes, I use a disc harrow, but only once, only when I am converting to agriculture or to do a new planting. Now, no, I said, I, sorry, sorry. I said, who's your hero? Hero. Hero. <laughs> hero. Um, uh, write it in the chat because in my in Mexican English is not the same as uh, UK English. I'll do it now. Here, um, person you respect most. So the person that you. Oh, would... my hero. Wow. Yeah. My hero. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of heroes. Uh, there are great men that I am standing on their shoulders to be able to learn and to say all of this. I started with Andre Bosan that I mentioned, Newman Turner from the UK, uh, Leather Barrow in Canada. Uh, she wrote a lot about the Cuban sweet clover that I really like to use. Then fast forward to uh, uh, um, Juan Carlos Avendaño from Mexico and the grazing systems. Um, he was wrong in some things, but he helped me to see the great uh, impact of the leaf to stem ratio. And then uh, Mark Bader of Free Choice Enterprises, the mineral man of the different mineral style cafeteria style program. And uh, Johan Sisman from Zimbabwe, Africa. He mentored me and he helped me a lot to uh, answer my deepest questions that nobody else could. And of course, Alan Savory on his book, uh, um, Colistic Management. I got a lot of good out of it, especially his first book and the second one, not so much, but the first one, I was totally agree. So you see, uh, each one of us will have heroes, but we need to teach others. So this has, can be a continuous improvement of mankind. Mankind, not only us, we learn and we get from others. We improve as much as we can, and then we pass it on to others so they can improve more, more on that. That's what we need to do, and that's my passion. Well, thank you very much. A lot thank of heroes you. there. Yeah, a lot of heroes. I have a lot. Well, Jim, that was amazing. That was amazing. And thank it's kind you. of whetted our appetite. Uh, so Liz and I, we always say we, we like to be on the cusp of um, just challenging okay. thinking and um, looking at different... Um, like I am pushing, the same. Pushing the boundaries a bit. And I think I am, the, I, I am the same. Yeah. Some might say you're a bit like Marmite, but I like you a lot. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you're not familiar with Marmite, don't Google it. Because she said something. Anyway, it's fine. It's a, <laughs> we'll introduce you to Marmite when you're here. It's fine. Okay. I will um, love it. Yes. Um, Nick, one take home from, for you for, to, from tonight. Um, I think it's um, looking at the future and all our environmental stuff, it's getting trees. Um, within within the grazing platform and thinking that's normal. Um, and I think as Jamie, uh, Jim said, um, we've got amazing hedges, but hardly any trees. Well, I, I had a, they did a podcast with me on a university with uh, Farming Connect. And they say that the government wants uh, farmers to plant 10% of their land in trees. Yeah. Well, I want them to plant 30%. Mm. So that's good. That's good. And they will give money to farmers to do it. So that's great. But the challenge is it's when they're not doing it within wood pasture, they're doing it trees over there, grass over here. And that's the that, issue. That it's doesn't work. Yeah. How, how will the mycorrhiza benefit from a, a forest? No, oh, yeah. it needs to be a savanna. We need a savanna. We need to bring the wildlife into the pasture and the pasture into the woodland, everything together. That's how it functioned a long time ago. And you're going to love that presentation that I am and, creating and right now. Jim, will you talk at all about cattle breeds, uh, breeds of cows, type of cow, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Uh, if you want to, yes. Uh, I, have a, I have a presentation for each one of the four models that I teach, which is a total grazing program, the adaptive genetics and selection, nutrition, because I'm a dairy nutritionist, and uh, optimal cabin season, which you already have most. Yeah, I, I didn't see any farm in the UK that calved out of season, so that's great. Yeah, and there's a, and at the conference, there's a bit more time, and then there's obviously the workshop as well. There's a bit more time as well. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for people to come and listen to you more. 
my take home was we've really got to work on our thinking phases basis because when we're concentrating we look slightly odd so yeah that's good to know um but <laughs> thank I, you very much. I, I i know i know let me tell you we have been taught by a failed experiment done in 1955 by Kreider that we should not take all the plant off. But he did it, and I am writing it right now in my other screen. He did it on four inch clay pots with juvenile seedlings of monocultures fertilized with synthetic fertilizers, cutting with scissors every other day. Every other day he cut. And that's where all of the information comes from the great grazing gurus. Everything that you see online, or if you talk to them, it all goes back to Kreider experiment in 1955. And that's dead wrong. Even Savory is dead wrong on that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that. That, that's why he couldn't shut them out of this uh, George Monbiot. If he had said that, end of discussion, but he didn't. I feel like it's an explosive ending. I don't know how to finish it. But anyway, we are over time. So this okay. just wets, as Nick said, this has whetted people's appetite. We might even get George up to Cumbria. Can you imagine? Nah, no. No, 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 no. no, no. Okay, that's a strong no. Fair enough. No, I'm, I'm, thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking whether we can get your dairy farmer to carbon calling, Jim. Your Welsh My dairy farm? Oh, you mean the David? David's my David. client. Well, I can ask him, just, just uh, tell me what to ask and I will tell him, yeah, sure. I don't know what is carbon calling. So first tell me. Okay. Yeah, are, are you selling carbon credits? No, no, no don't worry. No, don't no, worry. No, no. Okay, okay, then I don't understand. No, carbon calling is the name of the conference that you're coming to. <laughs> oh, he's going. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, I will invite him. He wanted me to go with him. So uh, maybe because uh, the cost wall is not going on, maybe I, I'm going with him. I don't know. Yeah, we I've been giving him advice for two years now. Okay, bye bye. We will solve it. Okay. Everything is fine. That's okay, fine. thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Thank Speak to you all soon. Take bye care. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.